I was not surprised that I got fired. I was surprised it took as long as it did. Um, uh, and I think others, in the, uh, those in this room or, or others will know that, um, you know, I've been passionate about this industry. It's treated me, it's treated my family, it's treated uh, my extended family extremely well. And nothing works if you don't have the land. And that is the key to all of this, and it's not about economics. Our legislation says nothing about economics, or didn't up until Bill 24. And uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is, is this is a piece of legislation that has uh, a long-term view. And, and here we are, I'm talking about the next 50 to 100 years out. These two people put this in place 50 years ago. Can you imagine how far out front these folks were with this piece of life? This was 50 years ago, for gosh sakes. And, the, and it, shook, it shook the community, not only here, but it shook the country up. Because what was put in place was a philosophy that this stuff is special. This land is special. And yes, you can do all sorts of things on it, but what we don't want to do is be building on it willy-nilly. And what we tried to do when I was asked to take over from this organization, the Minister of the Day, and I worked for six ministers in five years, uh, that was a little bit of a trick, and uh, two premiers, and we were asked to, to protect farmland when I was put in place, and I think that's what we did. And that's where we came up against some folks. What we were saying is this, this particular piece of legislation should not be focused around applications to release land. If that's the focus, then there's no other, there's no other outcome than the land is going to get released over time. You're going to pick it away piece by piece by piece. So our philosophy or my recommendation to government, which they never did accept, but we did it anyways, was we're going to, look with, we're going to work with communities and we're going to get them on board and they're going to find out that agriculture is a very key component economically within their communities and if they got to expand, the last place they look is agricultural land, not the first. And that's what has been happening in this province and this country and maybe North America more so than any other part of the world. Agricultural land in most parts of the world is very well respected. But the legislation is there and, there's, and, and nobody has ever said that communities shouldn't be growing. But what we were saying is if you're going to grow, do not automatically look at agricultural land. Uh, I was flying back from uh, Cranbrook, I got to Kelowna, I got a phone call and 30 seconds later I was done. Those were the circumstances. I, I, I guess the, it, it goes a long ways back beyond that. Um, as I said, I, ex, I had six ministers. Um, the first three, I think, bought into what we were doing. Um, and the first three came along prior to the 212 election. Everything changed after the election in 212. And, and um, I think there, there's, there has been within this, um, this particular group, uh, uh, for a number of years, a lot of agitation against the ALC, um, and I think those folks uh, got their wind up after the 212 election, and they were going to do something about it, and they did. Um, I don't think, uh, how do I put this? When I was appointed by Minister, the Premier, um, Premier Campbell, uh, it was a long process. I went through a, 
quite a quite a process. I I had three meetings um, with various folks that interviewed me, including the the deputy minister and a, a bunch of others. Then I had two other meetings with a, a host of cabinet ministers, and then I had the last meeting with the premier of the day and. Um, and when he said, "If you, you know, you got the job if you want it," but I want to say you probably, uh, you're probably taking on, under my expectations, one of the toughest jobs in in the government. And um, I said, "I think I'm up for it. I'd like to give it a try." And he gave um, he gave the go ahead, and and the minister of the day gave me the go ahead to go around the province do a complete review, and I said before, I wrote a 110-page review. Uh, Colin Fry and um, Brian Underhill, who were key staff at the time, we traveled the province extensively with a number of commissioners, uh, saw things that were wrong, and the first thing was I felt that if we're gonna run an organization with applications as the key, and that's our only job, we may as well fold the tent, because over time, this thing's gonna go. Uh, I felt that we should run an organization that um, uh, removes farmland as an exception, not rather as a, an expectation. And there's still a lot of expectation out there, and I thought we had to break this cycle. And Sig, you would know, uh, I, I know all of us, that, that there's not unanimous acceptance within the farm community for the ALC. Uh, I, I, since I've been a young guy, I, I think I've, I argued very, very hard within agricultural politics at the various meetings, and Harold uh, did as well, and I certainly did, that uh, this is good for agriculture, it's for, good for the long term. Uh, of, I, I guess both within that group and within my family, as I said to Sig tonight, if my mom and dad knew I ever was, was chair of the ALR, I, I, I would have been disowned, run out of town, and uh, never farmed again in the Bullock household. But uh, it, it was that way, and I thought we had to change that uh, expectation. The other thing I felt is we had to get the speculation out of farmland. Speculation on farmland is, is uh, you know, people, there's a lot of people with a lot of money and they're prepared to sit and wait. And uh, they put a lot of pressure on folks. And I thought that the way that the ALC was governed at the time with, um, and this was a real stickler, uh, six, as we've gone back to now, six regions with three folks in each region, I, I, I inherited six ALCs that were running independently. And they're all making different decisions in the six regions across the province, and they were looked upon by the politicians, both provincial and municipal, as their people not as commissioners for the ALC across the province. Um, and the other thing I recommended was that that had to change. We didn't need 18. I had a budget of $1.9 million, which sounds like a lot, it's bugger all. I had 18 commissioners plus a chair, that's 19 of us, and I had 17 and a half staff. I never did meet the half staff, and I'm still looking for that one. So, but that's what we had. We had we had more governance than we had actually people working. I'm giving you what I think the litany was. Then I was struck to to get a CEO, and I said, okay, if I get a CEO, given what I think the the, the expectations are for. Salary benefits, I'm looking at 200,000 bucks. That's 10% of my budget, I don't have it. I don't need a CEO. What the hell do you need a CEO for? I've got perfectly good people here. We're running the organization. And I ran up against a lot of problems there. But 
the first three ministers in the first regime that I worked for were all on side. And I'll name them. Steve Thompson comes out of a strong farm family. Family started farming back in the Okanagan, what, say, late 1800s, probably, 1880, 1890. The next one, Ben Stewart, come out of the Okanagan, same thing. Family started probably 1905, 1904. Strong agricultural background. And then I had the, the goofiest guy in the world, Don McRae, who comes out of a school teacher, but was the best agricultural minister I have worked with since provincially Dave Stupage, way back when, who was probably, well, again, somebody had to push this thing politically and Dave Stupage pushed it, with the backing of the Premier of the day. So I'd say provincially he was the best minister I've worked with, and, and federally it was Gene Whalen, who again was one of my mentors as well. So those... Those, th those three, and I'll tell you, Don McRae from Cowichan, New Comox, wherever. Yeah, it's up the island here somewhere. <laughs> New bugger all about agriculture. Nothing. But by God, he asked good questions. And he took the advice, or he didn't. And if he didn't, he told you why. And there was no arguments. He just asked questions. The guy was good. Then along comes the election and things changed dramatically. They never talked to me and I just did what I wanted to do. I said, this is what I'm going to do and it's, I'm reducing my 18 commissioners down to nine. I felt one was good enough for the, this area, one was good enough for the Okanagan, one was good enough for the Fraser Valley. I needed two for the Caribou, I needed two for the Kootenays, and I needed two for up north because of the great expanse. So that gave me nine commissioners. And they were not operating as regional, they were operating as provincial. I was traveling my people, all, I was traveling these people all around. I was mixing them up. They were the, 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 the folks from here, we're traveling to the Fraser Valley. They were traveling to the Peace River. My, my commissioners had the broad view of agriculture in this province, and frankly, they knew the business, and it doesn't matter where the hell you're from, the decision on the ALC is based on your legislation, not on the political whims of either the municipality or the provincial government, and that pissed them off. And it really pissed off the North. And it really pissed off one of my agricultural ministers up there, who then winds up one day at, at an application hearing, and it's all public. This is, you can go on the website and find this one. Puts his har hands, arms around the applicant and starts walking off. And here we are with my commissioners and I'm running an organization that is part of the judicial system. This is not a willy-nilly organization. My commissioners are like judges, and they've got to be treated that way. And I, I gave them hell. We wrote a report. I took on the mayor of, who also showed up of Fort St. John and the minister of the day or became the minister of the day and of course it ruffled some fetters, feathers but the ALC and organizations like that are creatures of government. If the government wants to change the rules like they've done that's their prerogative but once the rules are set they do not come and start to lobby us on applications. If they do that, it's gone. And I think that was the beginning of the end. And uh, we stood up to them. And, and the result, I'm not surprised at the results. I'm disappointed because I think we were going in the right direction. 
I think there's a, there, there are folks in this government that believe we are going in the right direction, but there's a group in this, there, the people that are running this, the group down here in Victoria right now are going in a direction, and I think in 212 they got their wind and they're doing a whole bunch of things. My, you know, and my concern is beyond farmland. My concern is we're, we're digging up the country, we're, we're damming up the country, we're drilling up the country, and we're not respecting the country, and that, that bothers me to no hell. And the other thing I came up against is, is again, the Peace River. The Peace River, to me, is, is the future of agriculture. The North is the future of agriculture in this province. Figure in climate change, along with the soils. Uh, as we discussed, Harold Noah, we discussed last night, I, I spend a lot of time up North because I think that's where the future is. And I'm not talking tomorrow or the next day. I'm talking 50, 75, 100 years from now. And I, our job at the ALC is to look that far ahead, if not farther. And when I look back and I look at my career, which has been close to 50-some years now, that's not a very long time. You know, I was just young folks like these not long ago, right, Sig? Yeah. And, and, and when we look down the road, and you look where the Fraser Valley was, or the Okanagan was, or parts of Vancouver Island 50 years ago, 100 years ago. 100 years ago, we were barely any people here. Now look what it is. And we go north. You know, North, that Peace River area, Harold, what he was talking about, and I'm up in the Fort Nelson. We've got frontiers still in this province, and those frontiers have to be protected. I got up against the fellas up in Fort Nelson, and the mayor came to me and, and came to us and, and was yapping here in Victoria saying, why is the ALR up in Fort Nelson? So we went up there and had a good look around in Fort Nelson. You want to see soil? Go up to Fort Nelson. You want to look at the climate? Go up to Fort Nelson. They've got as long a growing period as the Peace River that Harold was talking about. They've got in the summer average of two degrees more heat, which is big. You know, it doesn't sound like much, but heat units and agriculture are key. And we said, you're not going. This is staying in the ALR. If you need some room in Fort Nelson, we're prepared to talk to you with the municipality, but you're not touching any land. So that pissed a lot of people off. I think I got fired for saying, listen, agricultural land is sacrosanct. And the last thing you do is remove it, not the first like we've been born and bred to do in this country, in this province. So that's the reason I'm gone. I was appointed on June the 5th, and uh, I came to, to, to Burnaby. I'd never been to the ALC office, and I, I, I went in, and I didn't know what to expect. We had our 17 and a half people, and I opened the door and walked in, and this place was as if I was walking into a, a kennel where the dogs were being beat. It was the most dour place I've ever been at, and, and you know, they were under tremendous, tremendous pressure, and uh, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, you know, I, I'd never seen anything like this before, so I called everybody together and, um, and, and, and met in our little boardroom that was no bigger than from here to, here to you. And, and I says, okay, guys, I, I don't like what I'm seeing here, but I want you to do your job, and I've got your back. If somebody has to fight with government, I'll fight with government. You do your job. And within months, that place was, was, was humming. But what I couldn't, we had some young people, and we brought some young people in, uh, good educations, knew nothing about what we we're doing, but by God, these kids are well-educated. They got, they, uh, I, I don't have a, a big formal education, but I've got a Harvard education in life and whatever I've done. I've traveled the world. I've had the most interesting life. I, there, there, aren't a, there, there are no corners in this world that I haven't seen, and I've seen it 
I'm not talking cities. I've, I've moved food products all over this bloody world, and I've, I've followed it, and I, it, it's been a thrill. So I've got an education they can't teach. And that, but these kids, what they have after coming out of university with whatever degree they have, their, their MBAs or their masters or wherever, they're incredible, and I'll tell you, I'm ready to turn this thing over to them. We've come a long ways, and I, and I don't want all of you going away tonight feeling bad. This, we're moving forward, folks. Agriculture today is not what I, I, I started out doing. You know, you talk about, or you know, and I'm going to get yelled at, but organics all well and good. Commercial or conventional agriculture today is nowhere near what it was. It's hugely different. And the difference between organics and good conventional farming today is minuscule. We are learning. Public confidence in the ALC is there. Uh, you know, I, I, I think I said before in the last... I, I think well over 85 to 90 percent of the province in, in, in successive polls over the last number of years have, have been in support. I, I, it's there. I've, I've got real fears if, if there isn't a change of government or a change of attitude uh, in the next election. I've got real fears. Um, because where they've gone with Bill 24 is, is, could be the beginning of the end if they leave it happen. You know, I, we got Zone 1 and Zone 2. Um, I, we talked about Kathleen while this, this you know, was going on. And, and I'll, uh, my feeling is that it's not going to take very long uh, for different, dis different things to happen in Zone 2 before the farming community in Zone 1 is going to say, hold it, uh, me too. Uh, why are they getting to do those kind of things and I'm not getting to do these kind of things? And, I, and that's a societal thing, and I, I, can, I can envisage in the next very number of years, a couple of years down the road, uh, where we're going to be in the courts over this, and I, I don't like the chances on that. Um, Bill 24 is dangerous, quite frankly. Um, the panel system is dangerous. I don't think the panel system is sustainable, and, and if they're going to keep it, it's, um, um, we're gonna, we essentially got six agricultural commissions uh, that are different and separate and uh, are going to make different and separate decisions all across the province, and, and that, uh, that attacks the integrity of the whole uh, legislation. When you start, you know, farmers aren't stupid people. They, they uh, compare notes. And when one, one group is doing this over here and the other group is not doing it over there, then, then dissension starts. And once you, once you start down that road, I think we're in trouble. So a lot of it will come down in future regulations because the legislation is passed and is bad. But the, regu the regulations that uh, the cabinet comes up with to interpret what's passed could be even worse. And uh, Richard mentioned last night there's the zone one and the zone two area and the zone, uh, zone one area, we're concerned that the non-farm uses may not have to grow half the crop on their farms. Well, why would we be concerned about that? Well, one, we're concerned about that is because that's what the farmers and the people that want to start these non-farm uses are already saying in Richmond and Surrey and Delta and the Lower Mainland, why should we have to grow 50% of the crop on our farms? And one of the reasons is because in Zone 2, they don't have to. They can, they, they, they've got more of, a, of an open door to do whatever they want. And so there's already a revolt on in the Lower Mainland that wants to have, a, have an open door to do whatever they want in farmland as well. One thing is we have lost so much land out of the ALR. It is a broken system. It needs to be fixed. Um, Bill 24 has made it worse. Um, and the thing with Bill 24 is I'm in the south and it, we are being inundated 
by erosion. It is happening now. I've spent my whole summer attending council meetings and going and fighting for farmland. Um, you know, um, so the erosion is already happening. And um, you know, a lot of people here probably have gone to all the same meetings I have. And is there any politicians in the room tonight? <laughs> and the reason I ask is I've been at, um, oh, this is my sixth or seventh meeting of this sort. And last night was the first meeting, and I guess tonight is, that I didn't have a provincial MLA from the Liberal Party at the meeting <laughs> taking furious notes. And, and we all, I had a conversation with all of them after, and it's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing that you would get fired from a position in the government, and then the government would come to all these meetings to see what we're saying. So, <laughs> So I think we were saying the right things. Well, I'd like to say at the offset, I'm really pleased uh, that Sig Peterson's here tonight because the role we played was quite different. Uh, it took me about five or six years to get the ALR idea adopted at NDP convention. I think I started around 1963 or 64, and we had an ad hoc agriculture committee, which I chaired, and we kept set, submitting that resolution to the conventions. and and. Believe it or not, some of the people on the Resolutions Committee told me, so we, we aren't sure we want to do that. It may uh, increase the price of food. And we said, no, no, if you save the farmland, you're able to grow more food and it will keep the price down. So eventually they accepted it, went to the convention, and, and was adopted, adopted almost unanimously. And then I actually got elected to the executive at the time in 1972, just before the election, and I got to write to, to draft the policy on agriculture, along with Sharon Yandel, who was an, uh, uh, somebody that worked for the hosp hospital employees union. We drafted the, the policy that we were going to set up a land bank. We didn't call it the Agricultural Land Reserve. We got elected, and then we gave Sig the job to bring it in. That's the way it's done. You know, you, you, the philosophers put it all together, and they've, they've got to have somebody else that's going to do the work. And uh, I'm really pleased that Sig's here tonight. It's been a long time since, uh, since we've seen each other, and it's, it's just delightful. I'll just say that uh, it's a real pleasure to be with the other two panelists tonight. This is one of the unusual occurrences where I've been on a panel where everybody was a farmer. Uh, generally, you get on a panel and nobody knows anything about farming, and they're, and they're talking about and telling you how to run a farm. So it's, it's great to be here on a panel with farmers that are concerned about agriculture. But what it is really, when I was talking to Natalie earlier, we're farmers with roots going back generations. Our parents, our grandparents, uh, and, and, and in our families, uh, we're farmers and, and, and we carried on. We're not the type of farmers that some of them are. They buy a piece of land and, and uh, the first downturn they get, which happens every, about every seven years, they, they, they say we, you can't make any money farming and they're ready to sell to a developer. And uh, I think it's some of the farmers with roots that, uh, that um, uh, really, really uh, uh, help to make things count in terms of saving our farmland. Our farm was established in 1877, and uh, we were the first uh, in British Columbia to put out a seed catalog. We put out a seed catalog in 1888, and, our, and we're on the same farm today, and we're growing the same vegetable varieties and producing the same seed that we did in 1888, except now we're doing it for the Seed Savers Exchange and for heritage farms across the continent. Uh, we also in, in imported the first uh, Holstein cattle to British Columbia, and we were dairy farmers. And that's where the sad part of our, star, our, our, of our story begins. Richmond, Surrey, Delta, the Fraser River had wonderful soil and grew wonderful crops and had wonderful farms, but it was desired by others. On that land, uh, we produced all the milk for Vancouver in the early days, all the food. It was, the, it was called the bread basket of Vancouver. We, in the school system at that time, they taught agriculture to the kids at school. They grew gardens. On our farm and our whole neighborhood in World War II, we grew victory gardens. And for those that are just into urban agriculture new, in World War II, we grew 40 42% of the food for the people of North America in victory gardens because we were exporting a lot of the food uh, to the troops overseas. In 1968, and I don't know if Sig remembers this, but uh, um, we had uh, Norm, was it Norm Peterson? The, the deputy, deputy Minister for Lands, Forests, and Water Resources was a consultant. And uh, he uh, drafted a report on behalf of the 
previous government and some of the politicians in the region to industrialize the Fraser River, and it was called Southwestern Shores. And what happened, in a, in, along with the resolution we were presenting to the NDP to save farmland, was there was a huge amount of opposition or, or um, environmental groups sprung up to fight the industrialization of the Fraser. The regional district of the day was called the Lower Mainland Pl Regional Planning Board. The politicians voted against the plan and WAC Bennett fired the planning commission and they were the, they were the representatives of all the communities. So that's how set the tone for when the NDP was elected because in Richmond, Surrey and Delta they elected NDP councillors largely because the saving of agricultural land and the industrialization of the Fraser River estuary had really been under the control of the provincial government instead of local government and this plan to industrialize the Fraser uh, was going ahead. So the ALR, when it was brought in, ended that. But it's back, and the irony of it is, and I don't know if I mentioned this to Richard, but the, one of the authors in 1968 that drafted the plan, he was, a, he, was a region, he was a planner, a train planner, drafted the plan to industrialize Fraser River farmland and the estuary. When he retired, he was appointed the chair of the land commission, the one before Richard. And what happened under his reign as chair of the land commission? They put the South Fraser Perimeter Road through Delta, 240 acres. They worked with the Tawasan First Nation to make part of the Indian Land Claim Agreement an agreement with, for port expansion, and I know that very well because I was one of the four provincial negotiators in negotiating the land claims at Tawasan. And the land claim of 300 acres going to the port was done outside of our negotiating. And the land commission didn't say a thing. And that's what Richard inherited. Well, that's all back. Uh, the Fraser River Port Authority, a couple of years ago, bought land in Richmond, didn't tell us. We had $10 million we were going to spend to dig irrigation canals and add drainage to the farms in Richmond. And one farm refused to allow us to have an easement along their property to dig a ditch. So we expropriated the easement. But when our staff went in to expropriate the easement, they couldn't expropriate it. It was owned by the federal government. The port was secretly buying the farmland. Anyway, we made that public, and they let us dig our ditch. But they still own the 218 acres. And there's another 60 acres owned by a private business that's associated with the port, and another 250 acres for sale. So the port is busy assembling its 2,600 acres in spite of the agriculture land reserve. And they feel that the federal government can overrule the Agricultural Land Commission. Under Richard's uh, direction, they looked at it and said, no, the port can't. Richmond, we've had our lawyers, and, and our lawyers say the port can't, but the port claims that they've got federal authority to overrule all levels of government other than federal rule. And we've all told them we'll see them in court when that happens. So that's what's shaping up in the Fraser River. They're also uh, putting in tanker ports to have pipelines across Richmond to the airport for jet fuel. There's a plan now to put a huge hydro line across Delta Farms because they want to put a liquid natural gas plant in. And every one of those incursions destroys farmland and, and puts it forward to the day that that South Fraser Perimeter Road, which is designed for industrial development on each side, will have industrial development on each side. Yesterday, however, we had a victory, and I just want to pass this on. They were planning a new coal port on the Fraser. And Richmond objected along with other communities. Uh, they were going to put a new railway line across Delta with coal dust blowing from the trains onto Delta farmland. Uh, coal going down the river on barges with coal dust blowing into the river, into the fishery. And we've got evidence of the coal dust blowing into Robbers Banks. And if you get crabs down there, they're full of black coal dust throughout their bodies. And we were all objecting to that. Well, it's been announced yesterday by one of the coal companies shipping coal out of Roberts Banks right now that they are suspending their shipments till about 2019 for the next three or four years 
from now through 2018 because there is a declining interest in purchasing coal in Asia, which I thought was pretty good. Four million tons of coal will not be going through Delta Port to Asia. One train a day will not be going through Delta farmland and through White Rock, where they're all complaining about the coal dust blowing through the city. And that means the Fraser Surrey docks that wanted to start a new coal port is out of luck because there's ex extra space at the port already. And I doubt if another coal company wants to go and take the place of the coal companies that are walking away from exporting Powder River dirty coal to Asia in a declining market. So that's the good news. I want to talk to you a little bit about Site C Dam. And I'm deeply involved in uh, fighting against the Site C Dam because their issues are exactly the same as the issues we're facing in the Fraser Valley and the issues you're facing here. The very, very best farmland in British Columbia for growing vegetable crops, not grapes and orchards and stuff, that's the Okanagan. But for the vegetable crops is the Fraser Valley, the Peace River, and southern, uh, uh, West Van uh, southern Vancouver Island that gets that marine climate that comes up the Gulf of Georgia. This is the warmest climate in Canada in this region, and that really helps. The, Site C Dam will flood 30,000 acres of the best soil in Canada. And their, their summer season is pretty much the same as we have here. They have a shorter growing season, but they've got hugely long days and they grow watermelon, cantaloupe, and, and, and stuff that actually we don't even grow here, that, they're, that they're, they're able to grow up there. And there's enough land there to feed a million people. And I've calculated out if it's being farmed at 3,500 pounds of CO2 going into the atmosphere, putting into the soil every year, it's sequestering into the soil every year about 50,000 tons of carbon dioxide, which is taking out of the atmosphere. You flood that land, you're filling the carbon sink. That's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we have to worry about that's, uh, that's causing climate change. This, the Site C Dam area is half the distance from here to Los Angeles. So you get, a, get away from the, the trucking and the, the fuel and the, 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 the climate miles that, the, that you have to bring your food. People just haven't been able to get around the idea of bringing our food from the north instead of from the south. Well, the climate has already changed and we can bring our food from the north instead of the south. They tell us that the Site C Dam is, was, or they did tell us, was to provide power for LNG. But along with the coal, there's a disincension to build or need more LNG in Asia too, because guess what? They're converting to solar and other, other means of alternate power. And if you build an LNG plant, do they really want to buy power off of us through BC Hydro? They're piping natural gas from elsewhere in BC or Alberta, and they're using uh, the, the generated power to convert the natural gas to liquid natu natural gas, they can do it just by burning their own natural gas. And they produce their own, uh, their own LNG. So they don't need Site C. What's happened in California is amazing. 500,000 acres went out of production in California last year. And the rain that's coming now isn't going to help. The, the, the rain doesn't soak in the soil. It just washes everything away. And I contacted one of the almond farmers down there through the internet because they had ripped out their almond trees, which use a lot of water. And they have put in solar panels. And he's making more money with a solar farm selling electricity to the grid than he was growing almonds. So why not go solar? Well, the other thing they've suggested, and this is what I'd really wish I could show you, is that we need the power for the urban areas of British Columbia. And before the announcement of the Site C Dam a couple of years ago, Metro Vancouver was looking into generating our own power. And we've had a program going with, with a Dr. Shepard from UBC to analyze what it would take to produce the electricity we need in Vancouver. And he's come up with a plan, and he's got a map of all the buildings in Vancouver that, that presently could have solar on the rooftops. 
And just those buildings alone could produce enough solar power with the amount of sunshine we get for 900,000 homes or households because some are apartments. The Site C Dam produces enough power for 450,000 homes. So, so just for renovating and putting solar in the city, we can produce double the electricity that the Site C Dam would produce. And we can maintain all that food producing land. And in Richmond, we've already got two projects going along those lines. Uh, one is we've uh, put in geothermal power. And uh, we're drilling holes in the ground, putting pipes down on the ground to get the heat from the ground to warm houses. And we've just done this for the last two years. It's our own district energy system owned by the city of Richmond. And we've already created an, enough heat to, to heat 12,000 homes. And we could spread it all across. We could do every home in Richmond over a period of time. And the other area where we can get power is from, believe it or not, the Columbia River. I'm old enough to remember, Sig probably remembers the Columbia River Treaty, where we built dams in the, in the Columbia. We actually helped all those farms in the Columbia by controlling the Columbia River waters. We sell them power. But one of the clauses in the deal is when we have got want the power back, we can sell it to ourselves at a lot less than we can produce new power. So we don't need the Site C Dam at all. One other thing I want to tell you about, and this is something you can take home with you to your own city councils. One other thing we're doing in Richmond, we've got anaerobic digesters set up. It's called Harvest Power, and I invite people to come and visit it. And we want something quite controversial in 2009. In the urban areas of Richmond, we banned all cosmetic pesticides, no Roundup and there's a $1,000 fine if you use it. And to make sure in 2012 we banned GMOs, because the only reason to have GMOs is to use the pesticides, because that's what they're for, so we banned both of them. We collect all the lawn clippings and the leaves and the yard waste from all the houses and, and, and businesses in Richmond, and it goes to Harvest Power, and it goes into these big domed digesters, and they speed up the process of, of, of making compost, and it produces electricity. The carbon dioxide goes to the air. We now have a huge mountain of organic compost. We call it Mount Richmond. And this summer, we started uh, putting it on the farms and, and, and using it as soil additives and soil fertilizers that you, where you don't need the chemical fertilizers. And it's something that every region should be doing. But you've got to make sure there are no poisons in the compost. And so we just banned everything. You can't use it. But what we're doing is we're doing what my professor, Dr. McKenzie, taught me 60 years ago. Put the composts and the materials in the soil and replenish the soil. Yes, you can use chemicals if you want, but that's what's going to change our climate back in terms of agriculture. And you need to save the farms to do that. And you need to in improve the agriculture that we're, that we're doing on the farms instead of allowing a lot of the fields to grow weeds in the hopes that you get your land resowed which is what's happening throughout the region. Our latest acquisition that we're working on right now, and this is the one I'm proudest of because it goes right back to 1973, and the Agriculture Land Reserve, that piece of land that had rich, British Columbia's first major allotment gardens, bought by Bill Vanders, and we bought it back, and we're putting it back in allotment gardens. <laughs> Except there's no fantasy. We call it the gardens. Well, we've got some pretty extreme times ahead of us. And with the drought in California and Texas and Arizona and all the southern U.S. moving up into British Columbia, we've got water problems and we've got land problems. Well, our cattle ranch at, at Cache Creek we're, wasn't able to produce enough hay this year because we had no snowpack. And uh, we were, had about 10% of our gravity flow water. The people down in the valley that pump out of the river have got lots of water for irrigation. We're buying hay. Guess where we have to buy it? The Peace River country that they're going to flood. So these are some of the problems agriculture is facing. I'm hoping you'll join with us to save the Fraser Valley farmland, to save the Vancouver Island farmland here, and to save the Peace River from flooding. Thank you very much. And then we have the real king of all this, and, and if you don't know, or you should know, it's Sig Peterson, who was the deputy minister at the time. Um, 
with the government of the day uh, and uh, put together this wonderful thing. Sig, if you'd stand up. And, and Sig and I have had an interesting career. I was, when, the, when this piece of legislation, when the ALC came in, I was just one of these young pups that, uh, you know, I was, I was pretty good at, at working my heart out and I knew the business, born and raised in it. And uh, I was very, very, very fortunate to come along at a time with um, folks like Sig who were, were in place, not only with the ALC, but in agriculture in general. I think at the time there was, uh, if you got into positions, the senior positions that Sig did, you came through the industry and you understood the industry and you knew what the industry was all about. And, and frankly, you probably knew uh, most of the, the key agriculturalists that were actually out in the field at the time. And I remember as a young, a young guy, I, uh, these are the guys you went to when you bought a farm and you thought you knew everything and then something went sideways. Who did you call? It was a, it was a dis district agriculturalist, horticulturist, and, and they'd give you... They never told you what the hell to do. That's what pissed me off. But they always gave you options, and then you had to pick, so they left it with you. But I want to say that I came along, got involved in agricultural politics at a very young age. Our family had a very serious... Um, we, we were significant players in, in the business at the time, and... Uh, and they, they sort of fingered me within the family, said, you're the one that's going to go out and, and, and we've, got a, we've got a stake here. You find out what's going on, uh, look after it. And through that, I met uh, Sig and, um, and we, we argued like hell. And I know tonight there was another event I was had and I said, I told him and I, I'll again tell you all, um, here's a guy that shaped young, one young man's career, one man, young man's track, and I'm not sure what the word mentor means, but there, there's a prime example of a mentor. And he was kind, um, very forceful. If, if we didn't agree, he, he said why, and I said why, and at the end of the conversation, um, we, we could go out for a beer, and, and I learned that young, and I've kept it with me for the last 45 years. So, Sig, thank you very much. And, and I was at Kathleen's tonight for dinner, and, and whose name came up? I said, geez, i got to get a hold of Sig. You know, I'm here in Victoria, and here he is. He shows up, and uh, there you go. I, again, Harold, not to, not to denigrate, but... I think Sig was, his papers were the one that uh, set this thing in motion, and, and there you go. I feel really good about this meeting. I retired 32 years ago, and uh, this is the first time I've been at a meeting where the, the Agricultural Land Reserves has been discussed so thoroughly. I want to compliment Harold for the excellent update on what's happening in the, in the realm of agriculture and many of the new and innovative ideas uh, that really lead agriculture into the future. Harold, thank you for lot, your Harold. excellent compliments tonight. And I want to thank uh, my good friend Richard here. His mother and father were friends of mine, so we do go back quite a, quite a long ways. And Richard, uh, was uh, president of, of the British Columbia Fruit Growers Association, and we went to many meetings uh, and uh, discussed some pretty touchy things, some near head butting. Uh, and uh, however, um, I'd hear all the arguments, one thing or another, because I was the I was the court of last appeal on this matter of uh, cost of production, on which the uh, income insurance program was was constructed. I was the last court of appeal, and I would wait and hear them all, and I would debate with Richard here. But anyway, probably I would say it then. Well, this is the way it's going to be. 
And, and we have accept. to go away a little disappointed. I'd go away disappointed that uh, my, uh, perhaps my standing in the field of, or the, the fruit growers wasn't what it was 10 minutes ago. But there's one thing about it. Even though we had those debates, we had those uh, very crisp con uh, disagreements, we always shook hands at the end and it made no difference. That's the way government and its clients should uh, function. I don't want to be the fourth speaker. <laughs> I just want to give you a few little highlights. Thanks, Harold, mentioning that his party uh, were already anxious and were urging the preservation of farmland. I'm a farm boy from Alberta, and I have spent 35 years of my life in the Ministry of Agriculture, starting from uh, being a field officer, of District Agriculture in Crest and Courtney, and then I was promoted up the line. And during the last 20 years, I was the senior officer in the, in the uh, ministry next to the deputy minister. So I, well, I did have the opportunity to make my, th my thinking influence policy and uh, delivery of programs. Well, I had a vision on my own that what we, we would preserve the agricultural land. That had to be done because there was uh, an average of the last 20 years before the statute came in, there was a loss of 10,000 acres of good farmland every year. Now that's equivalent to 100 farms of 100 acres size. That's a lot of good land. Site C. I appeared before the, the Site C Commission, I think it was 1978, it was near the end of my uh, career as a Deputy Minister. And we were able, not just me, but there were some farmers, there were agricultural organizations, BC Federation of Agriculture, all resisting it. Collectively, we were able to stop it. And that gave us a great deal of satisfaction. And it's only since this idea of shipping gas to the Orient that's revived it. Otherwise, uh, British Columbia actually has uh, ample power. <laughs> but we sell power, as many of you know. We sell power. And I think it was Richard, or was it uh, Harold that said, talked about, oh, yeah, I, I don't want to wander using the gas to produce power to send the gas away. I can never get my head around why, why that isn't a, a, the better answer than rather than dam and destroy uh, all this fine, uh, all high quality agricultural land. I've walked in that Peace River Valley with the farmers years and years ago and admired the crops that could be grown that far north. And somebody mentioned Fort Saint, uh, Fort Nelson. Nelson, even better, a better climate than what they've got at Fort St. John. Now, now I am drifting <laughs> into a speech. <laughs> That's not my intention. Folks, I'm wonderfully encouraged by you being here. The future of the protection of agricultural land is in your hands not in, in old guys like me. <laughs> Deputy ministers, there's an unwritten rule when you retire, you don't give, you don't give comments about the current administration. <laughs> I have lots of ideas and thoughts about what's happening and what, and what should, should be happening. I talked about four pillars in, in my vision of agriculture. Preserve the land, preserve the farmers. We have this farm income insurance program. Uh, uh, promote, encourage the processing of British Columbia products. And we had a very good program for that. And we did encourage a lot of uh, small uh, production of foodstuffs from production right here in British Columbia. And thirdly, the Agricultural Credit Act, uh, which we expanded. We had an agreement with the banks. If a young farmer wanted to take over the farm from his parents, he would get a preferential rate of interest. 
And in other instances, in order to make uh, this transfer, uh, we in the Ministry of Agriculture would provide a, an interest subsidy for, for a fixed term to assist that young farmer to get his feet under him and get the production and the income going. Those were four great programs. And uh, um, somebody mentioned Dave Stupich. Always, yes, indeed. Dave Stupich was uh, the Minister of Agriculture in 1972, and I was appointed as Deputy Minister, although I was already a deputy in the WAC Garden, Bennett regime. And Dave, <coughs> excuse me, I'm, I'm gonna catch my throat. Dave Stupich was a man with great integrity, uh, totally rock solid, took an awful lot of abuse during the first two years of this legislation, a lot of it. I went with him to many of these meetings where I'm telling you, being roasted, <laughs> you know, we, we were really fried <laughs> by the audience. They were so antagonistic about this agricultural land reserves. Um, I'm telling you this because bringing that ALR legislation into being was the most controversial piece of legislation that had ever passed through that legislative buildings until I don't know anything recent, but it was the most controversial piece. And one of the great pleasures in my life was even though the agriculture community felt that we had brought in something that took value away from them. Many of them, they, they were very angry. You've stolen my pension. You've devalued my land. You know, I felt for those people. I'm a farm boy. I grew up in a big farming operation. I felt deeply about this here. But what gave me great satisfaction was that about ten, eight or 10 years later, the BC Federation of Agriculture passed a resolution, not endorsing that, but endorsing the spirit of the act. They saw the light that something had to be done and this instrument was the right tool to get the job done. Now, I've been <laughs> the recipient of some pretty nice comments from both of these speakers. I feel humbled by it. So thank you folks for supporting the future of the LRs in your hands. I'm 91 years old. I hope uh, I can be around long enough to see it. <laughs> Continue. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. My name is Emmanuel Karisa Baya, and I'm from Kenya. I just came yesterday, and uh, I am a farmer. I'm doing organic farming. I feel so much privileged to be here this moment. It has been a very great learning. My passion is really in the soil because I believe the soil is the future for me and the whole world. And the hearing from all what you have been saying has been very touchful for me and giving me hope that something can be changed. And uh, I really want to thank the speakers for what they speak with passion. And they really encourage me to stand for what I believe is right that is caring for the soil. Thank you so much. Thank you.